It's April, and some things are winding up like baseball, and some things are winding down like hockey. Thankfully, Pennzoil Synthetics provides your vehicle with complete protection for top engine performance no matter what season it is, so you don't have to worry about ups and downs. Pennzoil, make the switch. This is the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. No muscle milk early for you right now. Oh, oh no, we are already it's down there. to muscle just, milk. That thing is there it. and gone in a hurry. Yeah, he already, he already chugged Listen, that. It gets you yeah. your protein in in a really quick manner. Mm-hmm. Um, the taste is okay. It's an acquired taste. Well, it doesn't last long. Mike, it's about two seconds is pretty much It's chugged. a wild card every day, though. You yeah. got vanilla. You got banana cream. I just basically search around for the days I get chocolate. It's all there about the chocolate taste. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Muscle milk. We love it. Uh, Adnan Burke in for trade today. Golik and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. So, LeBron James Fells is in a rare position. He's used to nothing but winning moments in the postseason. Winning moments brought to you by La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book at LQ.com and win at business. As we mentioned, he gave his best performance to triple-double. The rest of his team did not follow suit, and they go down. And Tim Legler says LeBron's been asked to do way too much. He might have more responsibility on him than any athlete in any team sport that's playing right now because everything is dependent upon how much offense LeBron James can create and he's going to find out quickly how hard it is without having a second superstar scorer playing off the ball in Kyrie Irving which allowed him to take some quarters off offensively but that's not the case and if his role players are going to shoot the basketball like this they have no shot in this series they might get swept if this keeps up that's unbelievable. They say they might get swept. It, it is unbelievable, but, but it's true. I mean, you, you can't keep shooting at the percentages they shoot at. And, and Legs is right. I mean, when you had Kyrie, you know, best handle in the game and scoring the way he scored, you know, as your teammate where you can actually take a breath. And, and even last year, you could, he couldn't take much of a breath. He'd sit for a couple of minutes. All of a sudden, he'd have to get back out on the floor. Played 44 minutes last night. And I don't know if you'll find that one consistent. I think that's it. And everybody expects it to be Kevin Love. To be who's that consistent second banana to him that's going to be able to be there night in and night out, game in and game out. And they don't have that right now. You kind of hope. And he's dishing to all of them. He's giving them all a chance, you know, and, 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 uh, yesterday nobody else stepped up. And Legs is right. If nobody else steps up, there's no way you'll be able to carry this team through this whole win. Yeah, the series. The stat that showed it off, Second Spectrum did this. They said over the last four postseasons, no one's created more shots for his teammates than LeBron James. 19 shots that he set his teammates up for last night off LeBron James passes. His teammates went 5 of 19 on those shots that they were set up. That is not a sustainable rate. To your point, he's not going to have one guy that can carry the load, especially as a ball handler and as a creator of offense. So he's got to have guys that are willing to carry it around him. We saw it. He had to play 82 games in his career for the first time this season. And while some of that I think is about him wanting to prove to people all right, I can do this just because you said I can't, a lot of it was I have to because we full on hockey line changed this team during the course of the season. I'm the one consistent thing that we have. A lot of that's been by design and so he's going to have to do it in the postseason too. Yeah, definitely concern right now for Cleveland, but because of the past I guess just history of success, obviously, LeBron can lean on. It's not like it's panic time just yet, although Game 2, if they lose the Q, is a different story. Also of note is what Paul George and Oklahoma City Thunder did yesterday. So of all the games to look forward to, this is an interesting matchup because you start to wonder, hey, are the Thunder that team that can challenge Houston and Golden State of the Western Conference? And if he shoots like that, 13 of 20, a game-high 36 points, well, maybe he deserves his own nickname. Yeah, I ain't met Playoff P, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Playoff P is his nickname. Yeah, I ain't met Playoff P, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it, it, it sounded it sounded very uncomfortable when Carmelo and Russell uh, was it Russell? Oh yeah, the, the Carmelo two of them. They got asked about it. Asked about, it, and they they were really kind of wait, what what what's this going on? Both of y'all, can you just talk about playing with Playoff P finally, and uh, just getting a chance to see him getting it going like that. That's his name. Playoff. That's the new name. I don't know. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Russ answer that one. <laughs> Playoff P. Uh, Listen, as a guy, as a guy who goes around calling himself the captain, yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna totally knock self appointed nicknames, but somebody gave the nickname to me. Not many people use it. Nobody gave this we, nickname. We, we don't know. Have we found out? Have we found out the origin of this? Did he, did he nickname himself? Like, has anybody actually called Paul George Playoff P except for himself? Cause if so, that's a violation. That's a flag. Without a doubt. We sounded like we heard the birth of it right there. Playoff P is the, is the Lance Stevenson of nicknames. It's horrible. It is living proof that just because you can doesn't mean that you shouldn't because yeah. it's just 
just lazy. It is alliteration and a reference to a time of year and a guy's name. That is not original. That is not a nickname. Yeah, but, once again, it, it's coming from him. Take a listen. Y'all yeah, ain't met Player P yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Y'all <laughs> yeah, ain't met Player P yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that is the long laugh of regret. <laughs> Player P. But, you know, listen, everybody talked about the side that won in this trade, you know, with Oladipo uh, going to the Pacers, obviously, and George. Going uh, to Oklahoma City. Well, he, boy, he did. Forgetting all the, the nickname stuff, thirty-six points, eighty points between the big three. Russ had twenty-nine, and Carmelo Anthony added fifteen. So, you know, it's a it's a big win for them over. And and uh, Paul George sat. I think the last minute of this game, he had a hip contusion that he hurt a little earlier in the season. Donovan Mitchell, the the rookie phenom for Utah, will be battling out with Ben Simmons for Rookie of the Year. He ended up hurting his toe. Yeah, uh, stubbed his toe a little bit. He came out in the fourth quarter, went back in. Quinn Snyder saw he was still in a little bit of pain, pulled him out again. I had x-rays, I believe, in MRI, and all that was negative. He, he, as, as he said, he said, I was just being a big baby about it. He said he just stubbed my toe. <laughs> Rare admission from yeah, the NBA. Yeah, how about that. it? Yeah. 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 So bonus, by the way, went along with Oladipo in that trade. Yep. So listen, it's one thing for people to say, well, it wasn't much of a return, but Oladipo's a guy, listen, I've worked with Tom Crane, Mike Jr., and he's obviously was a great analyst with us here at ESPN. He told me Oladipo's a guy, don't sleep on him. He's capable of bigger and better things. And once he's given that stage, he really has embraced it with Indiana. He was. He was given time and room to shine. And now we're all seeing that play right. out in a big stage to where we've made the point the national TV audience really didn't get as much of a chance to see. So I think much like last year's initial postseason series for Giannis and that Milwaukee Bucks team was really a coming out party on the big stage for him where everyone took notice of a guy we know the burden. Do it in the postseason. Right. Victor Oladipo's getting that chance now, and at least one game in is taking advantage of Do it. Do you feel like, Mike, they're that team out of the West, aside from the Rockets and Warriors, do you feel like could make a run because of that trio of stars? Well, I, I think people thought it was them or Utah. Right. You know, with, with what Donovan Mitchell was doing, you have Gobert who was probably, you know, in, in line for the defensive player of the year, mm-hmm. uh, that, that they w- could be the team coming out. Who was the other? I'm just happy we have other teams coming out. You know, we're talking about the 76ers in the East. Yep. Toronto, now we talked about Toronto before. They just can't get over that playoff hump. So really it's more talk about the 76ers and they put a, a you know, a huge, up a, a, a huge win in game one in their series, uh, with Miami because there are those that thought Miami would give the 76ers a little bit of trouble there and beat already ruled out. He, He's through the concussion protocol, but so he's ruled out for game two, but they didn't certainly need him in game one. And I think it had been Utah, possibly maybe Minnesota. Did you start thinking up of them going up against, you know, Houston and being that eight seed was going to be a, a tall task for them. So maybe still a year or two away for this year. It, I think the talk had been about Utah because of Mitchell and really about Oklahoma City if those three got together and played well. Well, and we'd been putting Oklahoma City on the backburns. Almost every narrative got challenged this week. Cavs in the first round, unbeatable, check. All the slander around the Boston Celtics as a two-seed, check. And then in the Western Conference, it had been all jazz leading up to this. And Oklahoma City reminded you, we're still here. And by the way, we're talking about all these teams, uh, Houston getting pushed by uh, the Timberwolves and all this. And by the way... Golden State step, Golden State snap back into form. Yeah, how'd yeah. that work? About to say, literally, flip the switch. The Spurs with that Kawhi Leonard, which has been a long ongoing saga. We don't need to, to re, re, regurgitate that necessarily. Aside from the fact Kawhi Leonard's not there, they don't know when he's coming back, and that's the bottom line. And they're not, they're a shell of a team without yeah, him. Yeah, they are. They're not going anywhere without him, obviously. And Golden yeah. State looked good. 113 92 win over the Spurs in, in one of the first game, in the, on the Saturday games. And speaking of Golden State, just to circle back to bad nicknames, this can't be real, Parada. Our researcher, Brett Parada, has what Kevin Durant had is the worst self-appointed nickname. Go ahead. A few years back, we were all trying to figure out how to nickname Kevin Durant, and he wanted to be called The Servant. That can't be real. What? what? No. <laughs> that Cliff, that, that can't be true. real. No. That's wanted, he wanted it himself. He said, call me The Servant. What, did he give a reason Stacey, can you for that? Confirm, do you remember this story? <laughs> you remember? Yes, I it believe it was, a, it was something about serving God. God, okay, Fe- February 18th, 2014. Okay, yeah. So uh, Dan Stanzik has pulled up the story. I uh, will read this. As he strives to win his first league MVP award, Kevin Durant is ready for a new nickname. Just call him The Servant from now on. The star forward told Grantland's Bill Simmons, I like to serve everybody. My teammates, ushers of the game, the fans. When asked why he chose The Servant as his new moniker. He likes KD. 
comparing it to the simplicity of AI, the nickname of former All-Star guard Allen Iverson. But for now, the servant is what fits best. I know it's kind of weird to make your own nickname, Torrance said, but I like that one better. That I, That is the heavyweight champion of bad self I like the one uh, the people were calling the Slim Reaper. And That's he, a great one. He yeah. didn't like that. He was trying to distance himself from that. I'm not here to be a guy of, I guess, death. Why not, man? Yeah. The Slim Reaper is awesome. I love that nickname. Well, especially relative to the rest of that trash. Oh, yeah. Those are impossibly bad nicknames. Horrible. For you to sit around with your team, because I imagine he consulted a few other people, you know what that means? He needs better friends. If that got to daylight, like companies that come up with really borderline ad campaigns that end up being pseudo-racist and awful, right. the fact that they got to daylight indicates you've got a bunch of people who somehow let this happen. A bunch of really bad friends let Kevin Durant come to the sunlight with the servant as a nickname the idea. Terrible. So, I think sometimes people get in their own way. Like Paul, Paul George already has a great nickname, PG thirteen. Yeah, his initials yeah. and his jersey number. It's incredible. His game is Cinef- rated. Cinephile endorsed. Cinephile again already. <laughs> really? The Cinephile battery is in the building this two, morning. Two in the first hour. Just seriously, listen to this one more time. When it comes to playoff P. Yeah, I ain't met playoff P yet. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that uncomfortable laughter is unbelievable. <laughs> All right, to cry up. for help. <laughs> Golick. Golick and Wingo. And Wingo. Mm-hmm. Trey Wingo and Mike Golick Sr. Great to be back here and <laughs> taking a little heat from my driving, perhaps. <laughs> uh-huh. Adnan Verkin for Trey. Golick and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN News, presented by Progressive Insurance. All of our phone guests on the Shell Pencil Performance Line with the Golicks. But Mike Jr., I'm sure your dad knows. Listen, a little heavy foot once in a while. If it, it gets you where you need to go, a rolling stop is just a suggestion. These are the kind of the rules we go by. These are, yeah, these are the rules of your, the road that I feel like, especially in a male dominant car, you learn pretty early, but dad passed that lead foot on more to my brother Jake yeah, than yeah. to me, who drives yeah. with more road rage than the average person yeah, should, but he, he, he could does. certainly appreciate your maneuvering. <laughs> the wife, the wife isn't really usually happy with my driving. It can be a little aggressive. Okay. Are you an aggressive driver as well? I, I am. Take I think that's the best word to yeah. describe it. I just, yeah. I've got places to go, Mike. There you go. Just, places to go, people see things yeah. to do. Exactly. Get out of the way. <laughs> okay? Before we delve back into the basketball conversation, eight games over the weekend, I do want to also mention, shout out to Rob Hanawalt and the West Hartford Youth Baseball League. Last year, well documented the story I told with Mike on this program about uh, my exploits as a bench coach. Yes, so, yes. So, one and eight as a bench coach, and yeah. now I've been promoted to a manager of the instructional Are league. Are you so really? I've got a lot of anxiety right now. We've got our first game this Saturday, and I'm going to miss the game because I'm actually calling the Alabama Spring Football game wow. with Herb Street and Galloway. So, can you imagine? So, you're the manager of this team. Team. Practices would have had to be tough because the weather's been horrible Correct. out here. We had a practice yesterday, but it was so freezing. So the team has barely been together, and you're yeah. going to miss the first game. Yeah, you still got to give out shirts. You still uh, got to figure out the there's, line. There's of commitment. <laughs> great job out of you. Yeah, you so, got to question a lot of that going into the holy. season. Attitude reflects leadership. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll. Uh, I'll Captain let you know how that done. goes throughout the season here. Well but done. We'll definitely Remember the Titans. That. Good job. I hope you have a hope you have a competent assistant <laughs> I was manager. Say, I'm relying on an excellent support yeah. staff uh-huh. around me to get through it. Speaking of an excellent support staff, Indiana Pacers. Last wow. night, jumping out to a 33 to 14 first quarter lead over the Cavs. They held on for the win in game one, protecting the lead brought to you by ADT. Considering home security, consider this. For 140 years, ADT has helped stop more crime than any other home security company. Visit ADT.com to learn more. Honestly, the Pacers talk about setting the tone early and often. Mike Jr., they certainly did that. Here's uh, Victor Oladipo, in fact. Long three, Oladipo. Good! Victor Oladipo a straightaway three, and that might be the dagger. With two minutes to play, it puts Indiana up by 17. Oladipo had 32 points. He was a stud for them. Out of the mean, by the way, with the call, he was being rated. Had every answer along the way, and I think that was the biggest thing if you're the Pacers you take away from this, is every time the Cavaliers tried to rally, and there were a couple of very strong surges in a high Hostile road environment. The Pacers found a way to answer. Yeah, to answer. L- listen, they they played well. They they, they played that blue collar, tough defense. Especially when Lance Stevenson comes out in the court, you're not sure what you're going to get. You know, as he's out on a garden, LeBron's always that's always a fun um, matchup to kind of watch. But Oladipo uh, carrying a little extra juice because he didn't like the way uh, Gilbert, the owner of the Cavaliers, kind of talked about how. Oh, you know, the Pacers didn't get a whole lot back for, uh, for Paul George going to Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. You know, Oladipo kind of took that personally. It's a team that was only on national television one time. So as a team, and I'm sure as a fan base, feel a bit disrespected from that side of it. And, you know, you, you, for at least this one game, you led wire to wire, wire got a little iffy up 23 at one point going into the fourth quarter. They were only up eight. You thought 
Here it comes. Mm-hmm. Here it comes. They're going to start hitting shots, or, or the Cleveland is. LeBron's going to take over even more, and they're going to pull out this game one win. But to the credit of, of the Pacers, they held them off. They, they went just when you thought it was going to turn, Pacers didn't let it happen to take a one lead on the road. Now here's what else is trending. The Rockets beat the Timberwolves 104 to 101 as James Harden scored 44 points, the second most in a playoff opener in Rockets history. Akeem Olajuwon scored 45 in 1995 at the Jazz. According to Second Spectrum, Harden shot six for six, five of five from three without turning the ball over in isolation in game one. Minnesota came to play here, fellas, and Houston, for all the talk about being the number one seed, didn't shoot particularly well. Harden, though, was sensational. Oh, he was fantastic. Seven, as you mentioned, seven to three, uh, 12 from three-point land. As a team, they shot 27%, so you can tell the rest of them did absolutely nothing. He ends up with 44 for the game, Capella 24, and Chris Paul just 14. Everybody else is in uh, single digits in this one. For a Minnesota team, we had Tom Thibodeau on at the end of last week. They went 0-4 uh, against uh, Houston. He, he knew what he was going to see. He was going to see a ton of three-pointers. But Houston didn't make a lot of three-pointers, so there was the opportunity, only making 10 of 37 three-pointers, there was the opportunity for Minnesota in this game. He kind of said, or, or Thibodeau said, Carl Anthony Towns needs to get more involved, the big seven-footer, more active in this game. I don't think they went down into him enough in this game either. I would think that may be one of the things that changes in game two. And this is a team I heard during the broadcast that said can see themselves attempting 53s in a game. This is what they do. This is who they are. And so just because they didn't have success doesn't mean they're going to go away from it. On the contrary, Mike D'Antoni said after the game, this kind of shows, all right, the fact that we could get a win when we were right. off and our best attribute in that night is a rallying point for this team. And it's the kind of stuff that you're going to need if you want to push past the points where they've all been comfortable and where they've had breaking points individually and as a team in the postseason. Yeah, certainly. I mean, listen, for Houston, they're a loaded team, but it wouldn't be stunning if Minnesota pulls up an upset. Adrian Wojnarowski was with last week. And so Minnesota, they're a fight in tooth and nail just to get into the playoffs, but they do have the talent there. Jimmy Butler, Andrew Wiggins, and Carl Anthony Towns is to play better, obviously called out by his coach. Tom Thibodeau as well. And as the world turns here, the Knicks adding Mike Woodson and David Blatt to their coaching search. Knicks are finalizing plans to be with the four top candidates for their head coaching job. David Fisdale, Mark Jackson, Jerry Stackhouse, and former Cavs coach David Blatt. League sources telling ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. New York also has permission to talk to former head coach Mike Woodson. And I got to tell you, Mike, looking at this list of people, I feel one word that is uninspired. There's not one name that I say, if I'm a Knicks fan, this is going to turn the franchise around. I, I think uh, of them, though, I would think Mark Jackson may be that guy. New you York know, guy. If, if you go, a New York guy. You go back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, what was Golden State when Steve Kerr took over? It's a pretty good team. Well, Mark Jackson was coaching that team. So that because that's the thought. Who's going to build? Is it going to be Blatt because of the European players on the team? And he's had so much success coaching overseas. He's going to come over from Turkey uh, for his interview, I believe, next week. Uh, for or m- maybe this week. I'm sorry for the, for the Knicks, but that's a long list of potential head coaches for a team that's kind of going to be looking for a new identity. And unfortunately, the Knicks don't, don't get to choose the perfect candidate right now. They're all going to have flaws. When you look at Mark Jackson, yeah, he left them with a, in a decent situation, but there's a reason that team got markedly better without a ton of roster changes when Steve Kerr took over. With David Blatt, you had a guy that had his team in first place, but had a little bit of trouble playing nice with others, coming over with a lot of clout overseas that he expected to translate right away in the NBA. So everyone's going to have flaws, but that's what you've got to expect because you're still the Knicks. How interesting would it be to go, Adnan, with somebody new like a Jerry Stackhouse who did well in the G League, you know, yeah. got a chance coaching there, and to be a first-time head coach in the NBA, that would really be saying, okay, we're really starting over here, young, new, you know, first-time NBA head coach with a team built around the seven foot three Porzingis who's coming off of an injury to see what we can build. That that would be an interesting move if, if they end up going that way. We've obviously seen that push in baseball, guys like Alex Cora, Aaron Boone getting their first-time shots at Manor and having success, but in basketball, I just don't know the success rate. They tried that with Derek Fisher, particularly right. in New York, yep. and obviously that blew up for them. Uh, more on David Blatt, by the way. They're going to meet with him the following week. So it is Fisdale, okay. Jackson, Stack yeah. this week, Blatt the following week. And the connection for Blatt, by the way, he played college hoops with Steve Mills, who's the team president at Princeton. So Blatt's an interesting like Mike Jr., because I, I don't think his Q rating is high. I picture David Blatt's face, and I picture people being angry. But uh, I, yes. but I, I, I see both sides. I, I see the side of Fisdale 
players love him, and right. Black doesn't seem like he's too well well liked by the players in a league where the top players can pretty much run things. Well, that's just it. You always have to balance the ability to connect with your star player and to make sure that your message resonates with those guys, and that always seemed to be the disconnect with Blatt. He was a guy that expected respect because of what he had accomplished elsewhere in a league where guys are always going to prioritize, and we see it with players. There's a lot of this talk about the European players that come over. There's just the, always that air of, we want to see you do it here before we're going to respect you in the way you think you deserve. Yeah, that is well said. Well, so, that was brought up, you know, we interviewed him, you know, with, with Greeny and I when he first got to Cleveland, which a little bit after he got into Cleveland, and kind of brought that up, that, that, that same thing up there about, you know, to prove yourself in the NBA, and he almost got offended mm-hmm. by that. I've been coaching a long time overseas, and we we're trying to, like, say, okay, but this, it this is, is a different. little different. Yeah. It's the NBA. He, he really kind of took exception to that. Well. Oh. I was going to say, if he gets a job in New York, there's already going to be cat calls and yeah. because you said the players, particularly, mm-hmm. I think will be frustrated. All right, Adnan Verkin for Trey Regolik and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. Golik Jr. with us as well as we're presented by Progressive Insurance and all of our phone guests on the shelf. Penzo Performance Line. Let's talk some more football because uh, Junior is here with us. And Dez Bryant was released by the Dallas Cowboys on Friday. Some context courtesy of our researcher, Brett Parada, from 2012 to 2014, Dez averaged over 1,300 receiving yards per year, 41 touchdown catches, 273 catches overall. So had at least 1,200 yards all three seasons. But 2015 to 2017, never even reached 900 yards, 17 touchdown catches, and 150 catches overall. Clearly was a much different player um, with Dak Prescott as as his quarterback rather than Tony Romo's Well, you know, and I heard a lot of people obviously talking about this one being Deion Sanders, who, you know, is one of the great all-time greats. And he said he thought it was a mistake because De- Desi felt still had something left in the tank. And my thought was he probably does, but is it worth 16 and a half against your cap? You know, that's what you have to start managing. I, th- I think Des still certainly has some talent to obviously be a player in this league and, and put up some numbers, but you just mentioned where the numbers had fallen to, yeah. and you have to manage that again, $16.5 million that you're going to pay him. And from what we understand, there wasn't even the talk of a pay cut. It was basically, you know, it's not going to happen. So no, no pay cut to stay. It's just we're going to, we're going to part ways here. They have a lot of dead money. They still had the dead money from Tony Romo. They have the dead money from, uh, also from coming up from Des. I think they have about 22 million in dead money uh, this next. So they have to work through that. But that's the thing about Des. I do agree he may have something left, but when you start putting the business side of it to the production on the field, to the money he's making, you can see why they, they went this way. And it, it gets another layer added into it when all of a sudden we hear the rumblings from Des that he believes that the, quote, Garrett guys, a lot of the team right. leadership, had something to do with his ousting. Dak Prescott, so much so that Dak got asked about it, asked if he had any role in this and had to sort of push back against that idea, which to me seems a bit ridiculous because to me this seems to be about fit. You can argue that Des might have productive years left in it, but that production hadn't been translating so far with Dak Prescott, who you know is going to be there, who you know at this point is going to be your future, and so why wouldn't you start putting weapons around him? This is an offense that needs to get faster and more athletic at the skill positions, and at the price that you're going to pay for Des, it makes sense that that might be a spot you start to look at. The Cowboys made a run at signing Sammy Watkins. The opening of free agency would have ended Bryant's tenure with the team in mid-March. They signed Alan Hearns, Deontay Thompson. They visited with and worked out almost all the top receivers in the draft, including Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, Cortland Sutton, and James Washington. So this is fascinating here to see Mike Jr. because this was a Dallas team that just a couple years ago, the offense was amazing. Why? That great offensive line everyone spoke about. Prescott was amazing. Ezekiel Elliott and Des Bryant. Now, all of a sudden, very quickly, it feels like this is an offense in flux. Well, and, and a lot of that had to do with injury. You saw when you had any cracks in that impenetrable ground game, everyone began to suffer. So whether it was Tyron Smith and Zach Martin who were in and out of the lineup a couple of times last year due to injury, whether it was Zeke Elliott and that constant uh, drama surrounding when the suspension was finally going to hit and take hold, you just saw a lack of consistency there that exposed everything else. And I said that was the best thing to come out of last season for them is you saw, all right, we have glaring holes athletically on the outside for our skill positions in this offense. That's not doing our quarterback any favors in this league right now, and so you have to address these going forward. So, and, and you look at that, and I've also heard people out there say, well, wait a minute, if this offense is considered slow, why don't you get rid of Jason Witten as well? And again, could be, and, and I get it, he's, he's, they're going to 
have to at some point get younger and more athletic at the tight end position. There's no doubt about it. Witt in the last two years, uh, 63 this year, 69, 77 the last three years of receptions, never over 10 yards a carry and five touchdowns, three and three. So they're going to need more production, but you got to pick your spots first. This was a $16.5 million cap hit with Dez. It's 3.4 for Witten. So again, the business side of it comes in and says, okay, we do believe at some point they're going to have to address this tight end position, but 16.5 takes more precedent in dealing with that cap hit if you need to get rid of something over $3.4 million. And where does Des land? Best fits according to ESPN.com. Bills, Packers, Ravens, and Saints. For his, uh, Bills very interesting because, of course, they need more offensive help, so Des would be a guy that will get plenty of touches there. Packers with Aaron Rodgers. Oh, yeah, Jordy receiver. Nelson gone now. You know, right. yeah. Ravens and Saints. So clearly all teams that are right now receiver deficient will see how much – Listen, and how much does Des have left in the tank? Is he a viable number one? Is he a number two? Is he a complimentary piece? Does he want to be that piece now? There's lots of questions. Well, we know as far as what he wants, he came out and said, yeah, first and did. foremost, he wanted to stay within the division. He would love to try and two reach times. out to one of those other three teams yep. and make sure that he would be able to go back and rub it in because he's a guy that came out and said, tweeted it, said, this is personal. I'm going to take this personally. Yeah, Dak Prescott saying Des Bryant, a hard guy to replace. We'll see just how difficult it will be. For the Cowboys. Once again, Golden and Wing on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. And some other NFL news to pass along. Rob Gronkowski will not attend the start of the Patriots offseason program. So just like his quarterback, Tom Brady, is not going to be there. He's still considering whether to play the upcoming 2018 season. He's had good communication with the Patriots. A $250,000 workout, $250, workout bonus in his contract, which is paid out based on attending a percentage of the voluntary workout. So for now... He's not going to be there, but does this? Do you feel any way this leans towards him returning or not, Mike? I don't think so, just because we've already heard that Tom Brady being back this season is a huge uh, uh, note in the positives for Gronk. I think that's got someone he can commiserate with, because regardless of what level or what extent you believe it's true, there seems to be at least the idea of frustration surrounding these two great players and their coach who all exist in their minds on the same plane and aren't being treated that way by that guy. So at the very least, you've got someone that's in your camp with that as far as Brady and Gronk together. This is a time of year where veterans take time off anyway. So this this especially, we talk about it so much with the guys that are using this as leverage and contract negotiation, but for a lot of veterans who don't have as much at stake, they're there in some cases the bare minimum to make right. sure they get that bonus. And a lot of them are using this time to be with their families, to pursue their other interests, to continue to treat this like an off season because at this point they know what their bodies need to be ready and they don't need to be there every day the way a rookie or some guy like I used to be trying to just scratch and claw to make the team needs to be. Yeah, it's exactly right. Guys are in and out of that. They need a minimum times a week to get the pay there, and then the bonus, obviously, the percentages, if they care about that mm-hmm. uh, at all. So many guys work out at different places. Now we hear, obviously, a lot of the guys that went to the U, a lot of them spend their off season all back there and work out together. You know, when, when I hear a player, and we heard Gronk, it, it, it talked about right after the Super Bowl about retiring, I discount anything I hear right after a season. I absolutely discount Guys are it. exhausted. They're not in the mood I, to talk I wait the for a couple yes. of months. If there's one, and then I normally continue to discount it, like I did with Ben Roethlisberger, mm-hmm. Le'Veon Bell. You know, at the end of the day, that's 20 million, I think, for Ben and 14 mil for Le'Veon. And, and I just think it's kind of talk. I don't really think they were serious. We knew Brady was coming back. Brady wants to play at least 60. So he's going to come back and play. Mm-hmm. Gronk was the one guy, as the offseason go on, went on, I thought to myself, all you hear is how well he takes care of his money. And Gronk is a guy, man, that just will go on and do his own thing. A- at some point, he just seems like, eh, I'm good without football. But that being said, I don't think he's retiring at all. I-, I never thought he was going to. It did enter my mind that, okay, he may be a guy that could say, I'll go do WWE or I'll go find something else to do Movies and, stuff and, and enjoy about life, you know, and, right. and do that. But I think he's going to play. But I, I could see him thinking about it for the hits he takes, the injuries he's had, the new rules that are out there and where he is going to continue to get hit, right. and that's going to be in the knees. So of him thinking, you know what, do I need this? And if he has really taken care of a lot of his money, can he walk away? But I think it's about 8 mil this year he's supposed to get. I absolutely think he's going to be back to your point, Mike. He and Brady together can commiserate on what we now see. You hear what Danny, uh, Danny Amendola said, who's with the Dolphins, saying, mm-hmm. I think Belichick's a great coach sometimes. He can be a blankety-blank. You know, the whole Malcolm Butler thing, we still don't understand. He can be a tough coach to play for. And I think it catches up with some guys. But the bottom line is, you have in the back of your head, I'm putting rings on my finger, though. Right. And I think it helps... 
Gronkowski's position as well. The Patriots now, they look rather deficient at wide receiver and with all their passing threats. I mean, Julian Edelman coming back isn't exactly inspiring for Gronk. He's like, listen, I'll come back and I'm going to be the guy and hopefully he can stay healthy. Uh, one other story to pass along here. The NCAA Playing Rules Oversight Panel approved altering football's kickoff rules to allow the receiving team to fair catch the kick inside the 25-yard line, have it result in a touchback. So they made their proposal to continue efforts to increase the number of touchbacks during kickoffs since fewer injuries occur during kickoffs that result in touchbacks than on kickoffs that are returned. All other aspects of the kickoff play will remain the same. The new rule, the latest in a series of changes the committee has made in recent years, hoping to make play safe. Listen, and going into the NFL, Steve Tasker, who was a guy who got drafted with the Houston Oilers uh, my year yep. and was one of the great special teamers of all time, there are going to be uh, 10 uh, special teams coaches and other, and some players that Tasker is going to join that are going to talk about this. We see what happened now in college with fair catch inside the 25. What's going to happen in the NFL? Mike, I don't see any way around this. I don't know when it's going to happen. The kickoff's going to go away. Yeah, I, I, the kick, I mean, and, and I saw some people with tweets out there about show the stats of are there more injuries on kickoffs? And I believe there are. And, yes. I, and I think it's been documented out there. And I'm sure we, we'll, we'll try and find that as well. That's the reason they're doing all this. You don't just say, Hey, let's think about doing this. You do it because you see a pattern a lot. That's why a lot of times you don't, you don't see. From the NFL side, a lot being done about Thursday night football when players are complaining about it. The NFL is saying, well, there's not more injuries. You know, there, there's, there, there's no, nothing that shows there's more injuries on Thursdays than on Sundays. But in kickoffs, I think you definitely see that, that special team play. Uh, the, the, uh, the new league coming out in 2019, the Alliance of American Football, they're not having any kickoffs at all. And we know some youth leagues that are starting to drop kickoffs as well. I see the kickoff going by the way of the dinosaur at some point. I just don't know when that's going to happen. It is. And so in the NFL, that means a loss of jobs for a yes. lot of guys that would make the teams off that to be backup linebackers and uh, and backup defensive backs and the like. And, and in college, in both levels, it means the loss of a valuable weapon, especially in college where you can have one player that is so much better than everyone else on the field with them. Special teams is often a place where that guy can make the electrifying play that's the difference in a game. And so even even with this new rule, you'll see teams that think they have an advantage letting their guy field it there and still try and take it out right. and advance the ball because you know it's an area you can get a win. Yeah, Steve Tasker, for his part, echoing Mike's sentiments, if they can find something they like that will help because it's a violent play in the game, it's become part of our vernacular. Let's kick things off, but I think it's days are numbered. I think they're going to come up with an alternative to the kickoff. Great stuff as always from Mike Gold Jr., first and last, 4 to 6 a.m. Eastern. The Go captain. Last. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Go uh, uh, Come for more Lance Stevenson hoof talk. <laughs> Uh, I tell you what, a great sports night last night, yeah. no doubt about it. And Wingo. What a day, what a show, what a time. One, two, three, four. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance. So he switched and saved. So it was all good. Joining us right now on the Shell Penzol Performance Line, Dave, the Cavs never had a chance in this game. I mean, they never held the lead. It was stunning to see them stomped like this from start to finish. How would you assess what happened? Yeah, wire-to-wire -wire victory by the Pacers. I had to give Indiana a ton of credit for their pressure defense. Uh, Ty Lue used the term, they invaded our space. And you saw that. The Cavs, if you want to start your offense, say, at the uh, foul line extended, they were starting at the three-point line. If they wanted to start at the three-point line, they are starting out near, near half court because of the Pacers defenders coming at the Cavs' offense in waves and with a ton of energy and purpose. And Cleveland looked shell-shocked. And you know, beyond, say, LeBron, Kevin Love, 
J.R. Smith and, and Larry Nance. I don't think any Cavs member even looked like they belonged on the court. Um, so they have a lot of work to do going into the game, too. So uh, on that note, you heard LeBron after the game. We all did basically pretty nonchalant about it, saying, guys, I- I'm down 1-0 in the first round. I've been down 3-1 in the finals. So, you know, th- this this really isn't a whole lot. I'm not worried. How worried should Cavs fans be at what they're seeing right now? I mean, they, they should be worried if they think that the rest of the series is going to look like game one. But I, I think LeBron has a point there where, okay, we preached – about playoff intensity, uh, he kind of chuckled at the idea that in the regular season, people can use the term a playoff-type atmosphere. And he said, no, 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 it's nothing like that until you actually experience it. Now these guys have experienced it. Let's see how they respond to it. I think um, Teron Lou's message was, you just got to play hard. That's the only way you're going to get out of this is to play as hard as your op- opposition is. Um, they didn't do that in game one. They have two days to make adjustments two days to get their bodies and minds right. And, uh, you know, they know what to expect going into game two. Uh, Certainly, that's one thing you can take away um, from that beatdown that they had on Sunday. And, of course, LeBron's going to rely on his past success, Dave. You know, saying after the game he's been down before in a series, it was down 3-1 in the finals against the Warriors, not worried. But at the same time, game two obviously has a heightened sense of urgency. But do you think that some of these players may be viewing it as a must win, you lose two games at home, then have to win four or five on the road against Indiana becomes immeasurably more tough. Yeah, I, I don't know if anyone in the, that Cavs locker room is going to use that terminology, but I would imagine that would be the mentality that they adopt going into game two. If they fall down 0 2 to this Indiana team that obviously feels like they have a little bit of destiny on their side with the way the series start, with the way they came together, um, trading away a franchise piece in Paul George to make this team possible, uh, and going into Indiana where they have a little bit of that Hoosiers underdog lovable feel, uh, you don't want that situation. So, uh, again, I don't think anyone, when we go to practice day and talk to the team, anyone's going to use the terminology must win. But in essence, that's what this is. Along those lines, Dave, you, you have been with this team, obviously, more than anybody, So, and, and this is complete speculation and opinion on your part, but how this is going right now, and I guess looking into the into the future a little bit for LeBron James, do you think there's already, no matter how far they go, a decision in his mind whether he's staying or going, or do you think it still has to be played out? I don't, I don't think so, just you know, because everyone that I've spoken to involved with LeBron all year long have been consistent in saying that he won't know and he doesn't know and he, he won't make that decision until everything's over. Um, but, you know, you have to wonder. I, I didn't, I wasn't overly blown away by LeBron's body language yesterday, not suggesting by any means that he was not trying to win or not engaged in the game. But you just wonder if somewhere in the back of his mind, he doesn't believe that this current Cavs team can win at all. And if you don't believe that the essence of that team is championship medal, uh, perhaps, you know, somewhere uh, you just make the equation, I'm not going to go quite as hard for that closeout, or I'm not going to dive on the the floor for that loose ball because it goes back to the old Ricky Waters line with the Philadelphia Eagles for who for what. Um, I don't know. I'm not saying that's the case, but you, you start to wonder um, if if he is somehow already thinking about going somewhere else, how that could affect this Cavs playoff run. Very strong Ricky Waters reference there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big Eagles fan at the Super Bowl, so I see it all comes together now. Right now we just got go. Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio, and ESPN News. Victor Oladipo, Dave, best player on the court last night. Uh, which is saying something when you're on the same court as LeBron James. How good is this guy for people who have not paid attention uh, on a national audience just how talented he is? I mean, the guy not only is a dynamic scorer, he can score you know on all three levels, as they say, you know, off the bounce, uh, mid-range, three-point uh, range as well. But he led the league in steals, and he did it again in game one. He had four steals. Uh, so he affects the game on both ends, and that's what true – impact players do and when the Cavs made their runs um, you know especially the the, the two back-to-back long jumpers he had in the fourth quarter the three to put it to 12 and then uh, and then the long jumper right after to put it to 14 that's what great players do well they sense the moment where their team needs them 
and they perform. Uh, so I, I can't be more impressed by him and just his demeanor in the post-game press conference where he said, you know, are you guys surprised by this? I mean, that was only the second nationally televised game for the Pacers all season long. And the only other time they were on that television was when Paul George came back to Indiana. Uh, so that was, you know, that got the attention because of Paul George, not because of what the Pacers are doing. And he said, what, are you surprised? This is what we've been doing all year. And so certainly, um, you know, if I'm a player, that's the type of leader I'd like to get, to get behind. Oh, believe me, Dave, it's all over Twitter. We All the tweets like, you guys showed no respect for the Pacers <laughs> like this all year, giving us no respect. It's involved. everywhere right now. So they're, they're all feeling their oats right now, which is fine. Good for them. As, as far as the Cavs here going forward, we all know what LeBron means to this team. The next person in line that you need for consistency is going to be Kevin Love. And then after that, it's been kind of a crapshoot on who you're going to rely on. In your mind, who is that third guy? Who is that third person that needs to be the most consistent for them? Well, I think they'd like to have that person to be you know, a Rodney Hood because they think he can score in bunches. But Rodney Hood was one of the players that looked uh, consumed by the moment in game one. Uh, Kevin Love, first of all, they need to get him more than eight shots. You know, that's not on Kevin. Uh, Kevin doesn't control the ball. He's at the point guard. So they got to get him more involved in the offense. He missed three shots early and then only got five shots the rest of the way. Uh, that needs to be an adjustment going into game two. I, I think J.R. Smith, they will lean on more. Um, that coaching staff loves J.R.'s mental toughness when he is on a roll. <laughs> and obviously, uh, he looked like that in game one. Um, but I, again, it, this is what happens when you trade away Kyrie Irving and, and don't get that that diamond in return, um, you know, they need to have uh, impact by committee. So it's, it's Hood, it's George Hill. Um, hopefully Kyle Korver's foot feels better enough to get play more than four minutes like he did in game one. Um, you know, they're going to need three or four guys giving them double digit scoring. No doubt about it. And But as LeBron James has said, he's the last guy to ask about playoff deficits, and I would think most people feel like game two they'll come out and not this series up. Dave McMenamin, always great stuff. Follow him on Twitter at Mc10. Thanks so much, Dave. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. Golick and Wingo. It was all sort of one big giant yeah. jello mold. It's very interesting where that went. Another man who loves baseball, our baseball insider, Tim Kirchin, joining us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Get the feeling of being rewarded with gold status at Shell with the Fuel Rewards program. Download the Fuel Rewards app, join, and start saving five cents a gallon today. Timmy, Bartolo Colon was released by the Rangers on March 24th. He's re-signed two days later, and last night on our airwaves on Sunday Night Baseball, he almost pulled off the nearly impossible. What were you thinking watching it? <laughs> Well, uh, it would have been one of the coolest things we've ever seen. As you said, he would have been the oldest guy ever to do that. Nolan Ryan was a similar age, but he doesn't throw like Bart. He didn't throw like Bartolo Colon does. Now he doesn't look like Bartolo Colon, but just another reminder of the beauty of baseball. It comes in all shapes and sizes. And <laughs> here's a guy who throws basically all fastballs and says to people, go ahead, try to hit this. But you have no idea what quadrant it's going to, and I changed speeds off of it, and that's why he's had such a remarkable career and still going at 44. Amazing. Shapes and size is a key term there. <laughs> I really enjoy that. Nolan Ryan, by the way, threw a record 7-0 hitters. He threw one in 1991. He was 44 years and 90 days old, so... Yeah, Bartolo Colon would have been the oldest to do that. All right, Timmy, around the league right now, the early part of the season, but starting to read just just clips here and there about more and more guys that are going on the DL for this or DL for that. Where where do you think has been the the worst effect for this for a team and players that they have lost? Uh, there's so many teams that are being crushed again by injuries this year. And, Golik, there's something to this terribly cold weather that is affecting these players. And no excuses, no sympathy necessary, but it's so easy to get injured in a baseball game. And then you turn the temperature down to the 30s, and we have snow and rain and everything else. And that's where some of this is coming from. And it simply is not a well-played game anymore when it's played in this kind of weather. This is nobody's fault, and it's just the way it is in April, but with these, all these postponements and players not having their bodies in 
you know, in the right rhythm. Baseball is very much a rhythm game. They play it every day. And now, you know, twins are going to go four or five days without playing a game. That's really unhealthy for a baseball team early in a season. And I think that's part of the reason we're seeing as many injuries as we have. Talk with the great Tim Kirchner right now on Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio and ESPN News. Timmy, looking at the Mets, NL best 12-2. and two, We knew that with so many of us picking the Nationals to win the NLE, something had to go awry. And so far, the Mets have been that team that's been a surprise. And what's part of the surprise is this. Matt Harvey may get dropped from that rotation. He was a guy who you thought, well, he has to bounce back for them to have some consistency. But instead, Mickey Callaway's done a great job with his bullpen. Gaselman and Lugo have been terrific for them. What have you seen from this Mets team? Well, their starting rotation has been great. And when you start with DeGrom and Syndergaard in whatever order and those guys are healthy, you're going to have a chance. That's how dominant those guys have been. And Mickey Calloway, being a former pitcher and a former pitching coach, he knows all about this. And I think he's sent the right message to his pitchers this year. And maybe just as important, their lineup is pretty good right now. With Michael Conforto back way earlier than expected, Healthy Cespedes added Todd Frazier. That's a pretty good lineup to go with a, with a rotation, especially that can be absolutely dominant. And you're right, the bullpen's been great so far. Also, I don't think anybody saw this coming with the Mets, but I think we all understood if that great young starting rotation is healthy for the season, they're going to be a contender, and they've been they've been more than that so far. Yeah, uh, you know all Met fans are just waiting for the shoe to drop. They're waiting for the one injury after Very another. Very fatalistic group Oh, of fans. my gosh, so much so. All right, uh, Timmy, we sit here and we see the Pirates leading the Central at 11-4, and four, the Diamondbacks leading the West at 11-4. and four. So even with the division taken into consideration as well, which of these teams in your mind has the best chance to actually continue, maybe not at this pace, but as far as where they are in the division right near the top? Well, I I like where the Diamondbacks are, that's for sure, because they made the playoffs last year, and maybe they're maybe they're even better this year. I think they're going to miss J.D. Martinez, which, you know, he was so good as, after they acquired him, and in September he was ridiculously good. But I could see the Diamondbacks keeping this up for a little while. Their pitching is awfully good right now, and they can score some runs also. And Pittsburgh, look, the Pirates aren't going to the playoffs. I'm pretty sure about that. But I saw them this spring. Their lineup is pretty good. And this isn't a team that just got rid of everyone and they're going to win 60 games this year. They're they're going to be 500 team, I think. And that's pretty darn good when you're in the process of moving some people around. Further proof, Tim, we should never take too much stock in spring training statistics. Shohei Otani has been the story of this baseball season so far, not only hitting those home runs but pitching so well. Unfortunately, the start yesterday was postponed. But honestly, I I think as a baseball lover like yourself, it's just so great to see this story because what you always want is new stories and new players to love. And the way the Japanese just embrace baseball, we already knew the media coverage would be off the charts. Now the fact he's already matching those expectations. I mean, how great is this to see Otani delivering for the Angels so far? Let me tell you how good he is at this. He is better at this than anything <laughs> I have done in my life. He is better at this than anything you will do in your life. <laughs> A great Sorry, reference to searching for Bobby Fisher from Tim right. Kirchner. <laughs> that was just for Adnan. The point is, this guy is doing something that really hasn't been done since ba- the times of Babe Ruth. And it would be enormous pressure if he were coming here at 23 just trying to be a pitcher or just trying to be a hitter, and he's doing both of them. It's absolutely amazing in a very small sample how good he's been so far. I saw him in spring training and the raw tools were obvious, the power, the beautiful swing, the velocity on his fastball, the, the break on his split. All that stuff is going to play in the big leagues. I just didn't think it would be this good this quickly. He basically is slugging over 600 points higher as a hitter than the, the league is slugging against him as a pitcher. That's <laughs> that. Those are ridiculous numbers. Yeah, some great, great storylines early on in the season in baseball this year. We hope they can continue throughout the season, and certainly a storyline we talk about uh, every year is the meaning of Jackie Robinson to baseball and Jackie Robinson Day yesterday uh, in Major League Baseball. Talk about that for a moment, Timmy. Just, just still the, the reverence that is just held for this 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 man. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I, I still hope after all these years we understand how important Jackie Robinson was to baseball and to this country. When baseball finally figured this out, the country went along with it for the most part. So Jackie Robinson wasn't just a baseball player. He was a civil rights activist, and he really changed the game in so many ways. And because of that, I think we forget sometimes how great a player he was, how amazing he was on the base pass, how tremendously athletic he was in every way. And I just remember talking to Frank Robinson about this years ago, and I said, Frank, what did you learn from Jack Robinson? And Frank, of course, faced hatred and racism in the minor leagues, especially when he first came up. And he said, Jackie taught him the same thing. The only way to beat them and the best way to beat them is to go beat them on the field. And he said that was the lesson that Jackie taught all of us. And uh, I don't think we he will ever be forgotten, certainly, in baseball and in the history of this country. Yeah, nobody speaks with more reverence for the game than you, Tim, and I echo those sentiments. There's something about Jackie Robinson and Jackie Robinson Day that is so special. One more baseball question for you. Cubs and Yankees, both 7-7. Seven and seven. Which start concerns you more? Um, I, neither one of them concerns me, frankly, because it's a long season, and I think both teams will be in the playoffs at the end. And the reason I'm not concerned about the Yankees is all the injuries they've had, and their bullpen has been terrible. And their bullpen is great, but this is baseball, and great bullpens – pitch poorly once in a while and that's been the case among other things with the Yankees I think they'll turn this around and quickly and so will the Cubs Cubs have Anthony Rizzo on the DL looks like he's coming back hopefully tonight and I don't think there's much to worry about there and with either team if they do have some issues moving forward they have all the money and all the resources in the world to go fix it with trade or something else or a minor league system so both those teams uh slow start not too much to worry about. Tim Kirchner is always a blast to hang with when we're talking baseball. Of course, Tim is a Renaissance man. He can t- discuss many topics. And Tim, we often love to just talk movies. I know you and your wife, Kathy, love three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, but I've never heard your review yet on The Shape of Water. I preface it oh, by no. saying I love the film. <laughs> Mike Golick despised the film. You have to weigh in, Timmy. What did you think of it? Did you see it? No, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I'm always going to a Reds Pirates game, so I don't get to the movies as often as you do, Adnan. I haven't even seen it yet, but I've heard Golick. I know he hates it, and what what a mismatch you and him when it comes to the greatness of movies. It must be hilarious together. Timmy, I, I would just say that that matchup you always watch. Go back and rewatch them all from decades ago if you want to, rather than watch Shape of Water. You know, pull out any DVD you can. <laughs> A movie that I know you have seen, Timmy. R. Lee Ermey passed away. He played the drill instructor in Full Metal Jacket. How great. That first hour of that movie, how powerful Phenomenal. he was in that movie, right? Incredible. It was pretty It was pretty incredible. It was too intense for me. I can't take stuff like that. It's too hard for me. But I watched it. I barely got through it because I am so weak. I am so squeamish on things like that. That was a tough one. I, I, I'm with you. That was. We can all enjoy searching for Bobby Fischer and movies of that ilk. Tim Kirchner, thanks so much, Timmy. Thanks, Timmy. Okay, guys. See you. Golick and Wingo. Let's not expect too much. There's only one person out there that's expecting way too much out of this guy too early. We know who that is. It's his father. AARP can help you become your healthiest self. It's why we offer health tips for your body and your brain. So take on today and every day with AARP. Learn how at takeontoday.aarp. Some news that came down earlier uh, during the show, James Harrison retired, 84 and a half sacks, obviously put together a brilliant career. Although, Damien, me and Mike were a little bit surprised. He ranks 52nd all-time in sacks. Mm. Kind of would have thought a little higher than that. But, I mean, you picture him in his heyday, only the three seasons where he had double-digit sacks. But at his height, he was absolute terror when it came to sacking quarterbacks. As a guy who was in the trenches, what was it like for you when you saw James Harrison coming at you? Oh, he was an absolute monster. Listen, I give James... I applaud James Harrison because you got to understand where this guy started. He was an undrafted guy. I believe he got cut three times, mm-hmm. uh, by, I think by the, by the Baltimore Ravens and then went on to become one of the, one of the best outside linebackers in the National Football League. But I mean, the, the thing that made James Harrison unique was, first of all, his height. You know, he's a guy that's under six foot. He's, I mean, one of the strongest dudes that yeah. you'll ever come across. 
and he was just explosive off the ball. So if you're an offensive lineman, most offensive linemen, especially tackles, are tall. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, as you know, the game is all about leverage, and you are naturally have better leverage than than the offensive offensive lineman. Boy, you can wreak havoc on a lot of quarterbacks, which he did. He he seemed to, would you say, his game, he – it was a little too one dimensional for the game of today. Obviously, when you get older, your skills kind of erode some, but he always had that strength. But as I said earlier, the tweener used to be the odd person out in this league. Yes. Now the tweener is kind of that pass rusher, and he just kind of fits that one dimensional uh, road of you know you're going to get a workout playing against him, but you know not once he was past his heyday, you know he didn't kind of fit that that versatile athletic pass rusher that we're seeing in today's game. Yeah, he didn't he wasn't the type of guy that had all these different rush moves or, you know, the type of guy that could be out there in coverage because we all know the game is different today. It's a much more passing league. You gotta have guy you know, this is not the Blitzburger old right. where guys can just come screaming off the edge. Now you have to have more responsibilities and pass coverage and all those type of things. So he was kind of in that era, he was in a pass era playing in in, a, in an era now where it's much more passing. So take people down on the inside. When you get ready to play someone like that, we always talk about game plans. You do a game plan as a whole. You know what your offensive game plan is. I know what my defensive game plan is. Then you get into that individual study. Mm-hmm. Then you get in the room, whether it's by yourself or the other old line guys, or for me, the D-line guys, and you start looking at individual players and say, okay, what's the stance like? What does he do for me? You know, what, what's the stance? You know, what, what's the feet? What's the angles? All that. Is he looking anywhere? The, how they play together? Uh, splits and all that for you. And you're looking on the defensive side when you're going to play against a guy like that. What what was your thoughts on him when you know you're going to play against what you're watching for and what you're expecting? Well, first of all, he wore a visor, so you couldn't really see his eyes. <laughs> a, lo- a lot of times, the offensive linemen we like to see defensive players' eyes because sometimes they give give things right? away. But he wore a dark visor, so you can scratch that off the list. Um, you you look at get off. You know, I always say the one thing that scares the the, the number one thing that scares offensive linemen is speed. Guys who can get off the ball quick, those are the guys, okay, you like, okay, in practice, I need to simulate that type of speed off an edge. He had really good get off. Uh, the one thing about James Harris, he, like, again, he didn't have many rush moves. He just, it was really about speed to power. And what I mean by that, he would explode off the football. And because he was so, so short and strong, that he would convert that speed and come right into, right, right into your chest and try to bowl you over into, yeah. you know, into the quarterback or he'd try to get, the, you know, get the edge, come around the back door and, and strip sack the quarterback. So again, this guy was the ultimate competitor, a guy that came from really nowhere, undrafted and to play 15 years. I mean, that says something about the character of a player to be able to play that long. Let's take it a little bit further because I, I think this is interesting to people uh, is what other tips, what do you look for? I, I look for certain things from an old line yep. and back. What do you look for to try and outside of just lining up and saying, I'm going to block that guy, what tips do you see where the, where the defensive line gives something away to you? Uh, stance. Because <laughs> I can tell from a stance what, you know, what he's doing. If he has a lot of – if he if he has a lot of weight like over his knee, you know, okay, he's coming. He's screaming off the edge. If he's, you know, lined up square, okay, then he might be making a, a move inside or he might be, dro- you know, dropping out in pass coverage. So, you know, and if like for a defensive lineman, if you see the, the knuckles, the whites of the knuckles, okay, this guy's coming. But if he's kind of relaxed back, then you know that this guy, either he's dropping back or he's kind of moving along the line. So, there's a lot of nuances when, you know, a lot of things you look for as an offensive lineman and look for tips. And I tell people all the time with, with film study, defenses, defenses will give things away as far as players, uh, stances. It's all the little things, but th- those are things that you pick up, uh, you know, the more you're in the league. So true. I, as a defensive lineman, I would do the same thing from the offensive side, especially I'd see a guard. He'd be back a little bit, not in a stance, but back off the line a little bit yeah. when he's pulling. Right. You know, same thing with the knuckles. Is he white knuckling? Now, when I was playing, there was a lot less guys that were wearing gloves all the time, so you could see, yeah. you know, the knuckle and what they did, how much their fingers indented into the grass. Right. There was, a, uh, there was another thing that, that I always picked up on some was while the cadence was going on, Right at the last second, a lineman would just a hair dig in just a little bit with the foot, mm-hmm. with a foot. And what did that mean? That's a foot he's pushing off of. That's right. So if he's pushing off that foot, he's coming, you know, the other way. I would just look for that. And the other, you know, who gave it away the most? Running backs. 
running backs who come to the line and and they, they would look they would look where they're going or look in the direction yeah, right. uh and, and so you would at least know something good that, whether they're coming that way or the place and then you kind of look at the formation that you went in your game plan and say okay okay that kind of matches up that's right to what's going to happen that's yeah. right that's something that you know i've heard a lot of defensive players talk about a lot when watching the offense they'll look at the running backs yep to see, oh, okay, yeah. is, this, is this the type of guy that looks around and looks where he's going? If so, okay, that's a key. Mm-hmm. So it, I know people, you know, I know a lot of fans out there, they, they watch the game, but there's a lot. Oh, so much. There is so much that goes into trying to get that little yep. edge, you know, against your opponent. Having said all that, Damon, you own James Harrison, right? He never beat you for a sack. <laughs> yeah, of course, I'm going to brag on myself. <laughs> I'm going to brag on myself. But listen, man, he was a—that's that, the type of dude we call a war daddy. Oh he he was a load. Yeah. Woo. Other news in the NFL: Cowboys releasing Des Bryant. He's clearly fallen off in terms of production. He was averaging, or at least had 1,200 yard seasons 2012 to 2014. Last three years hasn't even eclipsed 900 yards. Is he still a number one guy? Because in his head he thinks he is, and he wants to go to a team in the division to show the Cowboys you made a mistake by getting rid of me. Production says no. Um, Dez has never been a speed burner. Even when he came into the league, he was really good at the 50-50 ball, strong hands. Um, that was the type of guy that he was, big physical receiver. Um, clearly the past three years has been a, a, a downward trend uh, as far as production. I would say – I would, in Dez's defense, though, I will I will say, um, quarterback play might have might have had a little bit to do with that because it seemed like with Tony Romo he had much more of they were much mm-hmm. more in sync as opposed to as opposed to Dak. So you know one of the things that I said last week was I would love to see Dak go to maybe uh, Aaron you know pair up with like an Aaron Dez. Rodgers or um, I mean yeah, I mean Dez Dez, Dez yeah, excuse right. me uh, Dez pair up with an Aaron Rodgers or. You know, maybe a, you know, a Drew Tom Brees Brady, the same Drew, thing. Tom Brady, a veteran quarterback that boy, is, is that. the boy that's playing, that plays at an elite level, that knows how to get in sync with his wide receivers. Then I, you know, then we'll see, okay, is this guy really a, tr- you know, truly a number one? Yeah, I think a lot of it just wasn't worth the 16 and a half mil cap For, hit that was. We, that we all know how that goes. How that money yeah. works. And then lastly, Gronk isn't going to show up to the offseason program or that's reported. Doing a lot of working out the TV 12 stuff as well, mm-hmm. but him not showing up, does that give you any pause as what you think he'll do this year? We, we keep talking about this. We, we, we've heard whispers about, you know, about Gronk maybe moving on. And I've always said, if you got your toe in the water, mm-hmm. That's usually a sign. Um, the, the, the one thing about Gronk is he's done such a great job with his money. Yeah. You know, as far as saving it, it gives you so much flexibility. And there's been talk about, you know, Hollywood and mm-hmm. all those type of, you know, He'll wrestling. do something. He'll be, yeah. Gronk will be able to, Gronk can punch his own ticket. And when you, when you have that type of flexibility or those type of things that you're capable of doing, he can, he can easily, Easily say goodbye. He can. All that said, I think he's coming back. I think he's coming back too. <laughs> One more but, kick at the can. I, 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 man, it. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, Twenty-eight is. years old. There's a Brady's lot still there. One more year. There's a lot going on yeah. with the Patriots organization this offseason. There is, and you heard Dammy, uh, read uh, Danny Amendola yes. about you know how he loves Bill, thinks he's a great coach, but he can be a bleepity bleep sometimes and tough to play for. And I say he, he's been unshackled. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's been unshackled I, from the Patriots. I, I think Gronk alluded to that. Yeah, that's I, right. That's <laughs> right. That that's right. With Bill, <laughs> great stuff as always, Damian Woody. Thanks, man. Yeah, no Thanks, problem. Man. This has been the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or just ask your smart speaker to play Golick and Wingo. Plus, you can check the guys out live weekday mornings from 6 to 10 Eastern on ESPN Radio and on ESPN News. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I feel like a whole new person. Disclaimer, you will not become a whole new person. This is impossible. You might be able to join a gym or diet program, buy a new wardrobe, get hair implants, but your DNA and physical form will remain the same. GEICO waives any and all liability if you attempt to become a new person, except a cyborg. If you choose to become a half-human, half-cybernetic organism with lasers for eyes, the GEICO legal team would be cool with that because, quote, laser eyes are pretty sweet. Pew, 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 end quote. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.